Okay, so thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, this week we have Henry Maxfield joining us from Santa Barbara, who's going to tell us about his work on uh, the entropy of bulk entanglement fields, evaporating black holes, um, all sorts of cool stuff. So Henry, thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, let me know if you uh, can hear me okay. Yeah, sounds good. Hello, Henry? We can hear you, hearing us though. Yep, it's okay. Okay, I think our internet connection here in Iceland is a bit unstable, but okay, good. So, okay, um, okay. We drop off, just um, keep going. Okay, so I'll, um, yeah, I'll try and pause um, regularly to give people a, a chance to ask questions. Um, so do sort of uh, shout if there are any, uh, any questions as we go along. But, um, so let's get started. Um, so I'm going to talk about a very old uh, thought experiment that people have been doing for many years, uh, or at least a version of that. Um, so I'm going to consider a situation where I uh, start with a, a black hole, uh, and I'm going to put it in a box, and this is going to be a, a stable situation where I can put the box in a thermal state because it's um, going to be in thermal equilibrium with this Hawking radiation. So I've got, this is a, a, a simulation from the Event Horizon Telescope of a black hole, which I've put inside this box, and there's Hawking radiation bouncing out of the black hole and bouncing back in. So this, uh, I could put, set this up in, in thermal equilibrium. Uh, and uh, then at sort of time zero, uh, I'm going to remove this box. Uh, and if I remove this box, um, the Hawking radiation uh, is going to start escaping the black hole um, and the black hole is going to start evaporating. And um, it, so here's a, a, a Penrose diagram now of this situation. So here on the right hand side is this box that I started with the black hole in and this this piece of the diagram is uh, is part of the of whatever stationary uh, black hole metric I started with. And then here at time zero is where I remove this box. Uh, so what happens in this situation? Well, first of all, there's actually a, a, a sort of shock of, of positive energy. So these are these red circles, one that's falling into the black hole and one that's going to fly away from the black hole. Uh, so this is this positive, this red line is this positive energy that's falling into the black hole. And We'll talk about that a little bit more later. And then subsequently, these green lines are sort of infalling negative energy. And this is the familiar negative energy you get uh, from uh, Hawking radiation back reacting in the space time. Uh, so, uh, of course, for most of us, uh, we have a favorite kind of box, and that is the kind of box I'm talking about, and that's anti de Sitter space. Uh, so, initially, I'm going to really set, uh, set my black hole up as. Uh, uh, asymptotically ADS black hole. Um, and then here at time zero, I'm going to couple the boundary of this system to some auxiliary uh, heat bath. Uh, and that heat bath is going to collect the Hawking radiation. Uh, so just the only thing I'll say for now about this initial uh, positive energy that goes in is that this is actually required for uh, considerations of causality. So uh, uh, if I didn't have this uh, positive energy impulse, and I just had this negative energy coming in from the Hawking radiation, uh, that would mean that something that was initially behind the horizon, uh, once I coupled to this external heat bath, could actually escape to infinity. So, uh, so one way of saying that is the um, if you compute the average null energy along this uh, along the original. Uh, event horizon, which is sort of this surface. This is the original event horizon of the black hole. Uh, if you compute the average null energy of that, uh, then in the absence of this positive energy shock, that would be negative, and uh, and that leads to the violations of causality. So that's a hint that we need this positive energy. I'll say a little bit more about it later. Okay, so that's the setup, and uh, I'm going to ask a couple of questions about this. So first of all is, uh, oh, before I do that, um, 
something that's, uh, that's sometimes convenient for us. I've been describing this as a black hole starting in a thermal state and allowing it to evaporate. Um, it's sometimes convenient to purify the whole system. So that means instead of starting in a thermal state, I start in this thermal field double where the black hole I'm interested in is living in this R system on the right. And I have some extra L system and I put it in this pure entangled state. And this is designed such that if I were to trace out the left side, and ignore the physics that's going on on the left, I'm left with a thermal density matrix on the right. Is this familiar? And then this other system, what I'll call the bath, uh, a third system, I'm starting off in its vacuum state. And then at time zero, we're going to be coupling the right system and the bath. And the Hawking radiation is going to go from the right system into the bath. So this, this vacuum bath is not depicted in this uh, picture you've drawn here? Yeah, the bath is not, is not in the pictures. You can imagine it as being this, this, this sort of region now off to the right of the boundary, but it's, but it's not there. Should I, should I interpret the, um, I guess, 45 degree thick lines at the top and bottom as artistic license? Or what, what's, I mean, normally we would draw a singularity. Uh, these, are, these are indicating where, where the singularities would be. Okay. Uh, so it's, yeah. Often we like to draw short jaw black holes, which have space like singularities, but really the generic case is, uh, is the singularities in them. So, um, and that'll be the case here. Okay, so uh, the questions I'm going to ask um, are, first of all, uh, what happens to the entropy of the black hole? So I'm talking now about the, the fine-grained entropy, so the von Neumann entropy of this black hole. Uh, so I've drawn a few different curves here. Uh, so the first curve is, uh, is what uh, Hawking might have uh, said after he did his calculation of Hawking radiation. Uh, so this, this is the, uh, the expected result you'd get from doing a semi-classical calculation, from doing just quantum field theory on this curve background. Um, so this, initially it starts at the, the thermal entropy of the black hole, and then as the Hawking radiation uh, escapes, uh, so when I'm talking about this semi-classical curve, you can think of this, for example, as being the, the entropy of the combined left system and the Hawking radiation. So it's if I if I'd formed a black hole from collapse and let it evaporate, this would be this would be a, a sort of proxy for the entropy of the radiation. And this, if the radiation is thermal, this entropy just increases for all time. Uh, but that's in conflict with uh, what we know about the thermodynamics of black holes. So first, this red curve indicates the thermal entropy. So that is the a sort of coarse grained entropy, if I just knew the energy of the black hole, uh, how many states would I think are available to it? So again, it starts off at some value and then it jumps, it jumps up because we had this positive energy which sort of feeds the black hole, makes it a little bigger, that increases this coarse grained uh, entropy. Uh, and then as the black hole evaporates, it shrinks and as it shrinks, it becomes smaller, the thermal entropy decreases. You shouldn't take the, the shape of these curves too seriously, just the sort of when they go up and down is the main thing. Uh, and when this red curve, the thermal uh, entropy, crosses this green curve, uh, then we're in a, in a contradiction because the red curve is sort of the maximal number of states available to the system at that energy. Uh, and if, the, if the, the entropy, so of course the entropy of the system can never be larger than the thermal entropy of that temperature. Uh, so if we have a, a unitary evolution of the whole system, information isn't lost, uh, then uh, a curve, a version of which was first drawn by uh, Don Page, is that the entropy should first of all follow this semi-classical expectation of Hawking, but then at this point where the thermal entropy and the uh, sort of semi-classical expectation match, then the entropy should follow closely to the thermal entropy, be, be close, to, uh, close to the thermal result. Uh, so the entropy, so this is more often uh, seen just for a black hole form from collapse where the, you don't have this initial piece of the curve, uh, the, ent the, um, uh, the entropy goes up for a time and then at the so-called page time, it turns around and starts coming back out again. Okay. So that's the first question we're gonna be asking. Uh, the second question uh, is, 
something slightly more detailed. Um, we're going to ask about throwing some small message into the black hole, throwing a diary with some information in it. And then we ask if we were very powerful and really understood uh, the dynamics of black holes and uh, how the state of a black hole translates into the state of its Hawking radiation. Um, when given this huge amount of power and knowledge, could we recover the, the information that fell into the black hole? And of course, Hawking's calculation tells you that the outgoing radiation is just thermal and it's basically independent of, of this, the information contents of what went in. So the information never comes out. It's information loss. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, if, the, uh, if the evolution of the whole system was unitary, uh, and with fairly generic assumptions on what this uh, what the system does the information actually comes out very soon So first of all, we have to wait until after the page time So this is after this time at which the entropy of the black hole is nearly maximal uh, But as long as we're after the page time the information bounces out after this logarithmic time and This this is a really really quite a short time. So it's very tiny compared to the whole lifetime of the black hole um, okay, and this is uh, this is a thought experiment discussed by uh, Hayden and Preskill. Uh, again, there's a sharp contradiction between what a naive semi-classical calculation tells you and uh, and what the expectation is of unitary evolution. Okay, uh, so those are the questions I'm, I'm going to be asking, um, and uh, there's an outline of what I'm going to be doing. Um, so the new ingredient I'm just going to go into this is uh, is so-called quantum extremal surface. I'll explain what that is and its relation to the, the generalized entropy. Uh, and this is going to be the sort of key new idea we, we put into this experiment. Uh, and I'll talk about a, a specific sort of solvable model we used for uh, asking these questions, which was JT gravity coupled to matter, which I'll discuss. And then we're going to ask about exactly what happens in this situation with an evaporating black hole. Uh, but just to give the punchline early on, um, is what we're going to do is really a semi-classical calculation. Uh, and it's entirely using sort of bulk effective field theory. We don't need to know anything, uh, anything detailed about the UV of the theory or anything like that. Um, but nonetheless, we're going to get some of these signatures of unitarity. So the page curve uh, and this Hayden Preskill are going to come out of the calculation. So that's what we're aiming for. Okay, so is, uh, are there any questions about the setup or the, uh, the sort of questions we're interested in? Not from us here, I don't know if other people do. Okay, good. Okay, well let's uh, start by talking about uh, this generalized entropy. So this is gonna be the uh, important quantity of interest. Um, so this, of course, goes back to Bekenstein and uh, further. Um, the generalized entropy is going to be defined as this, uh, as this combination. Uh, so the first, uh, first term here is uh, going to be the area of uh, some surface. So sometimes in, in the original context, this is a black hole horizon, uh, but it's maybe a, uh, we're going to apply it in a slightly broader context that we'll describe later. And then uh, this S out is the entropy of matter fields uh, that live outside the, the surface of interest. Uh, and this is familiar more recently from, uh, for example, the, the so-called FLM correction, the one loop correction to the Ryutaki and Aggie formula. Uh, and this, this quantity is actually, it's got some sort of remarkable properties. Uh, so really these two individual terms, for example, are, uh, are sensitive to the regulator and the UV scale in the theory. So, for example, the entropy is well known that entanglement entropy of, uh, of some quantum field theory uh, is divergent and it has a divergence proportional to the area. Uh, but also this G Newton is, uh, you have to tell me uh, what, I'm, I'm really mean the bare G Newton here rather than some IR value of the G Newton. And that gets renormalized. If you introduce matter loops, it renormalizes Newton's constant. So this is uh, sort of dependent on the scale you work at and dependent on your regulator. 
Uh, but there's now a lot of evidence that the com combination of both terms is actually UV independent, regulator independent, and so forth. So this is, uh, this is a very natural quantity to consider. And this relies on also generating some, some corrections to this area uh, from high derivative terms generated in the, uh, in the metric action. Okay, so that's the generalized entropy. Um, and we're going to consider this uh, on what I'll call a quantum extremal surface. So a classical extremal surface is something uh, fairly familiar. So you have some surface, if you vary it slightly, uh, uh, then the first order variation of the area is zero. So it's stationary to first order. Uh, so a quantum extremal surface will simply apply the same thing, but now to the generalized entropy. So this will be my definition of a quantum extremal surface. Uh, and uh, if there are several quantum extremal surfaces uh, that are sort of admissible in the given situation, uh, then we're going to minimize over the over S gen of those. Uh, and um, the key statements I'm going to use, which is this version is due to Engelhart and Wall, uh, is that in the context of uh, of ADS CFT, for example, uh, if you find a quantum extremal surface that is uh, homologous to some boundary region of your CFT, uh, you find this um, quantum extremal surface and compute its generalized entropy, then this is uh, supposed to be computing as fine grained von Neumann entropy or entanglement entropy of, uh, of the region that's, uh, that this surface bounds. So this is a a version, uh, a sort of souped up version of, first of all, the Ryutaki Nagi formula, which applies when, if this S out, we uh, ignore it, then we're just back to the situation where we're considering the area of a classical extremal surface. And this is the Ryutaki Nagi formula, uh, or rather it's covariant generalization, the uh, HRT formula. Uh, and then this extra entropy term was proposed as a one loop correction by uh, Lefkowitz Meldesena, or oh, sorry, by Faulkner Lefkowitz Meldesena. Uh, the version we're using is again is, is saying this is not just true to one loop, uh, but it is actually something that's true to all loops in an effective field theory. And an important part of our statement is the fact that you must extremize this generalized entropy uh, rather than, for example, extremizing the area and then evaluating the generalized entropy. Okay. So this is the, the key statement we'll use. Um, and the other uh, piece we'll use is, and okay, this is, this is going to be uh, useful for computing the von Neumann through our black hole. So, uh, so for answering question one. Uh, so for question two, we're going to use something else that's uh, uh, been recently uh, explored in, again, the context of ADS-CFT, which is subregion duality. Uh, so this says that if I have some subsystem uh, of our boundary uh, conform field theory, uh, then that is dual in a precise sense to uh, the exterior of a quantum extremal surface. So this is what's um, often called the entanglement wedge. So this is the exterior of the, the Ryutaki-Nagi surface in the, in the context where we ignore quantum corrections. Uh, and again, there's, there's now a lot of evidence for this. Um, so this is relevant for us for the Hayden Prescott protocol uh, because it tells us about when information is recoverable. So I'm going to have some state, which will be a mixed state, rho of t at time t on the boundary here. And let's say there's a quantum extremal surface that is uh, relevant for that state on the boundary. Uh, then subregion duality states that I have access uh, to anything that lives in this diamond. This would be the entanglement wedge. So if someone has thrown a message in at very early times and it's fallen in, uh, so it's inside this quantum extremal surface, then I don't know what's in the message. I can't decode it from, from this state at time t. But if someone throws in a message at a later time, then I can decode it. And the important, uh, this, uh, the important time here is this V, which would be the ingoing time of this quantum extremal surface. It's just you take the quantum extremal surface and you follow a, uh, a null geodesic back. Uh, 
And if the message is thrown in before this time v, then I can't recover it at time t. But if it's thrown in afterwards, then I can recover it. Sorry, is this the entanglement wedge or the causal wedge? This is the, uh, this is the uh, entanglement wedge, yeah. Okay. Uh, which is the, uh, so this is one way of thinking about it, or one way of defining it rather, is you take uh, the union of all uh, Cauchy slices that go between the boundary at time t here and the uh, quantum extremal surface. Or you take one such Cauchy surface and then you take its maximal Cauchy development. This gives you this diamond. So uh, often we are, uh, you'd more often see the entanglement wedge uh, extending to some whole region on the boundary as some uh, that. Uh, uh, so I could just put it. Uh, meeting the boundary at a single time. You'll usually see it meeting the boundary at all times because we're considering some unitary evolution of the boundary theory. But because my boundary theory is going to be coupled to this auxiliary bath, uh, it's important that I that it's anchored at just time t. Yeah, so the evolution of the of just the just the CFT alone is not going to be by itself unitary. It's only unitary the coupled evolution of the CFT and this auxiliary system the Hawking radiation is going to escape into. Okay, thanks. Okay, so these are the two things we're using. Um, so it's another good time to pause for questions uh, and then I'll talk about the specific model that we solved. Okay. Um, so the model we used here was um, was nice because we could calculate everything. Uh, uh, so what we used was so-called JT gravity, Jakeev's tidal point gravity, which is a two-dimensional theory of gravity, and we coupled that to conformal matter. So I'll talk about the conformal matter in a moment, but let's start off with the gravitational sector. Um, so as I said, it's a two-dimensional theory of gravity. The action is written here, here at the top. Uh, it follows from some nice UV complete systems in uh, particular in the near extremal limit of black holes. So for example, just an ordinary four dimensional rise in Nordstrom black hole, if you dimensionally reduce on the, on the two sphere uh, and take this uh, black hole to be nearly extremal, then you'll find uh, to good approximation is described by this theory. Um, and in this context where uh, where the uh, theory is obtained from dimensional reduction, uh, this phi, which is the dilaton, is just the area of this transverse space. Uh, so in particular, when I'm talking about the area that appears in this generalized entropy, for example, this will often be replaced by the dilaton because it's the area of this transverse space. Okay. Um, and, um, okay. So yeah, this is a picture picture of the of the um, of some Cauchy slice of for example a near extremal rise in awesome geometry where there's some uh, there's an ADS2 that emerges and then there's a, a transverse S2 which uh, which we're dimensionally reducing on. Uh, okay so the first term in this action um, which is the first thing you'd normally write down is the Einstein Hilbert term uh, in two dimensions is topological and so uh, just pure Einstein gravity in, in two dimensions is really an over-constrained system because of this, uh, this reason that uh, this is topological. Uh, and all this is going to do for us is give us um, a zero temperature entropy. So even if I had an extremal black hole, it still has some finite entropy. And this is all this does for us. Uh, so because this Einstein term is topological, to actually have any dynamics and be able to couple this to matter, uh, we need to have another term. Uh, and that's described here by this dilaton term, which looks like Einstein Hilbert, except there's this dynamical field phi that appears in the action. Um, and if I were to integrate out phi or look at the equations of motion for phi, you can see straightforwardly that all it does is impose a delta function that the, the scalar curvature equals minus two here in the units I'm using. Uh, and in two dimensions, that tells me that the metric is in fact locally isometric to ADS2, which I uh, 
written here in Poincaré coordinates. Okay. Uh, but now this field phi has some um, uh, dynamics. Um, and if I were to vary the metric, then you can see that this would have some differential equation for phi. Uh, and the only the sort of main contribution, this is sourced by the variation of the, of the matter action. And the variation of the matter action will just give me the expectation value of the stress tensor. Uh, so that this means that um, the profile of phi is determined by knowing just the um, just the stress tensor of the matter sector. I don't need to know anything else. Okay. Um, so this is how the matter is affecting the gravitational part of the system. Um, but because this matter action, I've explicitly shown that it doesn't depend on the dilaton. It depends only on the metric. It's not so obvious how uh, how gravity, how the dynamics of the metric is going to affect uh, the matter itself because the metric is just looks like some rigid ADS2. Uh, and the answer is that it's all in the boundary conditions. Um, so we use just the ordinary boundary conditions in ADS-CFT. Uh, so the induced metric, we have some cutoff surface, sort of close to the boundary of ADS-2. So that's going to be a small Z in these coordinates. Uh, and the induced metric on that cutoff surface is up to some, some uh, renormalization factor, some small epsilon, is giving me the, uh, the induced metric or the, the boundary metric of our CFT. So this is the ordinary uh, ADS CFT boundary condition. And the dilaton on this surface is, uh, again, equal to some constant phi b that I'm going to renormalize in this way. So I'm going to keep this phi bar r fixed as epsilon goes to zero. OK. Uh, so this proper time u, this u is the is the proper time in the boundary metric, and that doesn't necessarily match onto this Poincaré time t. So the important thing that's going to determine uh, this uh, cutoff surface is what I call the reparameterization, which is uh, giving the the coordinate Poincaré time in these coordinates uh, as a function of the proper time u on the boundary, which is the the sort of real clock. Uh, it's ticking on the boundary. Uh, and this is uh, exactly where this boundary is and what the reparameterization is, is determined by the profile of the dilaton, by, by this uh, boundary condition uh, on, uh, on the cutoff surface. And the boundary is, again, you can, you can sort of plug this in and check that this gives you the correct induced metric uh, on the boundary. And once I've introduced this uh, reparameterization, I can actually describe basically all the dynamics in terms of it directly. Uh, uh, so in particular, what happens is that this bulk term in the action, the R plus two, because we're on ADS two, this goes away. And all we're left with is this boundary sort of Gibbons Hawking type term. Uh, and this extrin uh, extrinsic curvature in this Gibbons Hawking term, uh, and when I rewrite it in terms of this reparameterization, becomes a, a, a Schwarzian derivative, which is something that may be familiar from QDCFT, for example. Uh, this is just some third order combination of derivatives I have written down. Uh, so the, this JT action actually reduces to a one dimensional action that just lives on the boundary, uh, the so-called Schwarzian action. And once I have this action in hand, I can, for example, compute the ADM energy, uh, conserved quantities, uh, which is to given by the Schwarzian, uh, and uh, and I can compute the dynamics, which is this coupling, uh, which is determined by this coupling uh, to the external matter field, and it just tells me that the uh, up to some this f prime, which is a redshift factor essentially, uh, the variation of the energy with time is just given by the uh, the energy that's coming inwards and minus the energy that's going outwards. So this is and I've just written down a solution to this theory without any matter, so for some constant energy. Uh, it, and the solutions all look like this. Uh, and the one thing I'll highlight about this is that if I take this proper time u to go to infinity, uh, we don't have f going to infinity. f approaches some constant, 1 over pi t. 
So that means that in these Poincaré coordinates, um, boundary time going to infinity doesn't correspond to Poincaré time going to infinity. Rather, Poincaré time sort of slows down and stops at some finite peak. And that value is going to correspond to the, the horizon of the black hole of this temperature. Okay. So that's, um, that's J.D. Garrity. Uh, and I just wanted to, okay, it's a fairly lightning review, but uh, hopefully it gives some idea of, of why this model is, uh, is potentially solvable. It's this fact that the dilaton dynamics are determined from the, it's the fact that the dilaton dynamics are determined from the conserved quantities of the matter. The matter propagates on this rigid ADS2 background and all the dynamics is determined by this reparameterization. I have a question. Is the relation between JT gravity and the Schwarzian uh, classical at the classical level or at the quantum level as well? Uh, so yeah, this is actually uh, true at the quantum level. So the way I'm going to be um, solving the system is actually to treat the 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 matter sector exactly. Um, you know, just as an exact quantum mechanical system, but I'm going to be treating the gravitational sector uh, um, classically. But this um, equivalence between JT gravity and the Schwarzian action uh, is actually, this is true uh, as a sort of full quantum mechanical relation as well. Perfect. Yeah, so really, so this thing here should be the, 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 the Hamiltonian of the system is this, uh, is, is this Schwarzian derivative as an operator statement, for example? Yeah. Um, good. Okay, so let's now talk about the matter sector. Uh, so, what I'm going to be doing, the, the thing that's going to allow me to solve this is that I'm going to assume uh, that my matter here is, is a conformal field theory, some two dimensional conformal field theory. And uh, I'm going to be able to solve everything because uh, this theory has a local performance invariance. Um, so here's a picture of the, of the states that we're preparing. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we have this ADS2. Uh, and uh, the bottom half of the diagram here indicates uh, a sort of Euclidean, uh, a Euclidean path interval that's preparing the states. So in particular, I'm starting with ADS2 in the hardle hawking state, which is the relevant state for the uh, thermal system that I'm starting with. Uh, and it turns out this is just the Poincaré vacuum on, on the half line here. So this uh, thick line on the right-hand side is the boundary of ADS2. Uh, and this dashed line is the t equals zero slice. And all I have to do is the path integral on this sort of quarter plane to prepare this the, this huddle walking state on ADS2. Uh, and I have this auxiliary system, um, which I'm just going to be take, take to be the same um, CFT as the bulk matter system, uh, living on some flat space, uh, some flat half space. Uh, and again, I'm going to, it's got a boundary here and it's going to be uh, prepared in the half line vacuum. So it's the same, uh, same discussion. Uh, but then in the top half of the diagram, I'm going to do a Lorentzian evolution and I'm going to remove the boundary of ADS2 and I'm going to remove the boundary of the bath and instead I'm going to glue these two systems together. Um, but the very important thing here is that I can't just naively join ADS, Poincaré ADS2 to the, the auxiliary bath system, but I have to join the appropriate physical time U to the time in the bath. So I need to join them with this reparameterization F that I talked about before. Uh, and that's what makes life complicated. Um, so the first thing I can do, this is just writing uh, the same Poincaré ADS that I had before, but in light cone coordinates. Uh, and if I um, replace X by uh, some new coordinate Y, uh, which is just related by um, yeah, uh, X plus or minus is F of Y plus or minus. So they're related by the reparameterization. Uh, now the metric is more complicated. 
uh, and the state is more complicated on ADS2 in these new coordinates. Uh, but this is done in such a way that I can join these two things together. So doing this uh, change of coordinates, why I can draw uh, as this new diagram on the right hand side, where I used to just have this very simple boundary, the Euclidean piece of the path integral, and now this becomes some wiggly thing, um, something that's a bit more complicated. But now I can just directly join ADS2 to the bar. Um, so I've got this. If you imagine this t equals zero slice is where I'm wanting to prepare my initial state. Oh. Uh, now I've got this um, Euclidean path integral in a half space that's preparing it over some slightly complicated boundary. Uh, so the first thing I need to do is because this boundary actually touches the t equals zero slice in the, at the point of the join, I have to do something to regulate this. So I have to smooth it out somehow. Um, but once I've done that, I have the CFT that lives on the whole real line and it's prepared by some path integral with a single boundary. Uh, and now the hard work is just to, um, is just to notice that this, uh, this is just a conformal transformation of the vacuum on, on the combined system of ADS2 and the bar. And I just need to find some appropriate conformal transformation uh, to map this actually to the vacuum on the, on the half line. And now it's going to be the combined system of ADS2 in the bath, uh, which is in the vacuum up to this conformal transformation. Okay, so this is the, the sort of uh, slightly hard work, but this is, uh, this is sort of the basic reason why this, everything is determined now by local conformal symmetry, is that I can make some map to the vacuum. So when I want to compute any observables, uh, and for us that in particular is the entropy, uh, all I need to know is how to compute observables in the half space of a CFT in the vacuum, and I need to know how everything transforms under a VAR transformation. Okay, so that's uh, more or less everything I'm going to say about the um, this matter system. Uh, so. What we find uh, is that uh, is that this regulator uh, introduces some positive energy shock, and that's that shock. The energy in that shock is determined by the scale of this regulator. Um, and then you can actually calculate the um, the energy flux in the state afterwards, and you find that it obeys this uh, simple equation which is basically saying that uh, we have this energy balance equation here and uh, there's this T plus plus is the uh, outgoing energy, which is zero. And this T minus minus is the ingoing energy, which turns out to be negative and it's determined by the conformal anomaly. And for anyone familiar with two dimensional CFT, they'll know that the conformal anomaly is closely associated with this Schwarzian derivative. So it may not be surprising that actually the, uh, this new incoming stress tensor is proportional to the energy. So it again, comes from the same Schwarzian derivative. So you find the dynamics is just determined by this simple equation, which we all know how to solve, uh, where this uh, K is, uh, is some small number because it's got G Newton. So this is, this is actually just the two-dimensional um, Stefan Boltzmann law, a one plus one dimensional version of Stefan Boltzmann. So there's, there's a T squared here rather than a T to the fourth uh, that's familiar in three plus one dimensions. Okay. Uh, and then the other thing we have to compute is the entropy. Um, I, yeah, one comment I might just make here, this, um, uh, the evolution of the energy is an exponential decay. Uh, this is, different from uh, from the usual say short shield black holes we have in four dimensions uh, where the energy radiated the energy gets radiated faster and faster and faster as the black hole gets evaporated because the black hole has negative specific heat in these cases in ADS2 the black holes have positive specific heat and actually they end up exponentially settling down to zero temperature rather than this um, catastrophic runaway so there's just a highlight, a small difference in the physics. 
Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so the second thing we have to compute is the entropy. Uh, and this, like I said, is you all you have to know is the entropy of the half line vacuum um, plus this anomaly piece that comes from the conformal transformation. So omega is a conformal factor that uh, appears in the metric. Um, and this entropy, once you compute it, has some nice uh, sort of quasi particle interpretation where you can imagine outgoing modes that live in the thermal state in the black hole. Uh, and you have some ingoing modes, which um, in this region in the past, again, are in the thermal state of the black hole. You can imagine them bouncing out of the black hole and off the boundary and coming back in. Uh, uh, but after this, um, after we couple to the bath, these ingoing modes are in the vacuum, but it's the vacuum appropriate to the Y coordinates. And, uh, yeah, and then you can, you can use this sort of quasi-particle interpretation to ensure what happens. Okay. Okay, so we've assembled uh, all the necessary ingredients and uh, hopefully I've given a, a bit of a flavor of, uh, of why everything is, is exactly computable and solvable in this model. Um, so it only remains to find uh, where quantum extremal surfaces live in, the, in this evaporating black hole space-time, and, uh, and then to apply that to the questions we asked at the start. Are there any um, questions before I move on to that? Not from my well, what, what, yeah. what, what happens if this auxiliary CFT is holographic itself? Um, you should look out for an upcoming paper by uh, Ahmed and Twaim al and Possibly others that that talks about this possibility. Um, yeah, so I haven't assumed anything about this CFT. Uh, yeah, all I need to know about it is is more or less its central charge, um, and it turns out that everything else is is basically independent of what CFT I choose. So this calculation goes through for holographic CFT just as well as it does for any other, uh, just just as well as it does for a free boson. Um, but, but in order for all your physics interpretations to hold, don't you need this bulk auxiliary, you need this auxiliary system to be holographic, otherwise your duality breaks down. So the auxiliary system is just, um, so for example, I could take my matter system in the bulk to be, um, to be just a free massless boson or something. Uh, and then my auxiliary system is just, uh, is again, just a free massless boson. Or I could, you know, I could take the matter to be the, uh, be the easing model, and I imagine that I'm putting, I'm sort of putting an SYK spin chain at the end of uh, an easing spin chain or something, uh, criticality, and coupling them in the right way. But I guess uh, so, what is how do you know that you've pr preserved um, the ADS CFT dictionary after you've coupled things in this way? Um, so I haven't done anything. Match. Otherwise, uh, you can't go between the two. So I agree you can couple whatever you like on either side, but if you want to claim that there's still a holographic relationship between the two, then I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so if this, if I, so let's say, imagine this is a free boson or something, uh, then this coupling between uh, the, this, this joining of the matter sector in the bulk uh, to an equivalent matter theory in the auxiliary system, you can just describe it by some, adding some single trace source to this, the um, to the this sort of holographic CFT, uh, it's just that that single trace source happens to be an operator in the auxiliary system. It happens to be the boundary value of the field. Uh, so everything you can you do here, even with the the matter system, this this auxiliary system being a perfectly ordinary matter system, a spin chain or something, some simple system, um, everything is uh, is well within the regime where we sort of understand the. Uh, uh, the holographic theory. So, yeah, but if you talk about adding single trace sources, those are those are operators that already exist in the original theory. If you want to add new single trace sources in some auxiliary theory, then I, I need to know that the partition function of the new total CFT is still dual to um, the new system. Um, let's see. Um, yeah. So, if I want to talk about this, the the this. 
um, gravitational system as being holographic, I should really be, okay, so I have, that means I have some zero plus one dimensional system, some quantum mechanics that lives on the boundary here. And what I'm doing is I'm uh, taking that quantum mechanics, which has a very large number of degrees of freedom and it's strongly coupled and all these things. Um, and I'm just coupling that holographic system in a simple way to an ordinary quantum mechanical system. This is, there's nothing, that, there's nothing has to be holographic about this, um, this other system. So I'm just, um, Okay, maybe I should wait for this paper, other paper you mentioned, and then it will be. Yeah. Well, yeah, and it, but this is, um, yeah, okay. It's more complicated if you can try to consider the 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 matter system to be holographic as well. But, um, but you certainly don't need the the matter system to be holographic. I just so in other words, I take my Hamiltonian to be equal to the uh, the Hamiltonian acting. So I, okay, my Hilbert space is going to be um, the Hilbert space of. Uh, of my holographic theory tensored with the Hilbert space of the bath, which is some is simple quantum mechanical system. And my Hamiltonian, I take to be the Hamiltonian of the holographic theory plus the Hamiltonian of the bath. And then I add some simple terms. And these simple terms are going to be, say, on-site um, on -site terms in my spin chain or my auxiliary system, um, multiplying single trace operators in the CFT. Okay, thanks. Good. Um, uh, yeah. uh, okay, so now we, we search for a, a, a quantum extremal surface. So the first um, obvious place to look for a quantum extremal surface is, uh, is close to a classical extremal surface. And naively, that's the only place you'd expect to find them. Uh, so we'll start off there. Uh, so the only place there's a classical extremal surface in this uh, in this ADSU spacetime. So here, these these surfaces are just going to be points in uh, in one plus one dimensions. Um, okay. So the only classical extremal surface is the original bifurcate horizon of the eternal black hole I started with. Okay. Uh, so I'll I'll start looking near there. Um, so the area uh, close to this. Um, surface, if I move in the space light direction, it's, uh, it's quadratic in some uh, spatial coordinate, so say the Poincare coordinate set. Um, now, once I add the correction from the entropy of the bulk fields, uh, the fields near this point are going to be entangled with the Hawking radiation that's escaped at early times. So in particular, it means the entropy uh, of matter outside this quantum extremal surface um, is, going to, uh, is going to behave roughly linearly with uh, the distance if I move the surface. Uh, so, uh, so this means if I add up these two terms and extremize, uh, we actually find that the quantum extremal surface uh, as time evolves at early time starts to move outwards. And you can do all these calculations uh, exactly and find where this what happens to this quantum extremal surface. Uh, but yeah, this is roughly what happens. Um, so this is sort of not, uh, not the most uh, interesting case. Um, the more interesting thing that happens uh, is that we can actually find, uh, uh, sufficiently late times, we can find that there's a quantum extremal surface living in this space time very far from any classical extremal surface. So how does this happen? So I want to try and find some quantum extremal surface that lives uh, in the space time up here. Uh, so the difficulty is that if I vary this uh, surface in the ingoing direction, I'd like the generalized entropy to be stationary under this variation. Uh, but the area is sort of very, uh, is, is varying quickly the whole time. So if I start out of the boundary, the area is very large. And as I move inwards, it just decreases smoothly, uh, steadily down to zero. Uh, so if the entropy is just going to be a small correction to the area, which we expect, so the area comes with a one over G Newton, so it's enhanced in importance, uh, it's hard to see how the entropy term can ever cancel the variation of the area term. Uh, 
but it can nonetheless. And the important effect is that if my uh, if I'm considering the boundary system at some late time up here, uh, it's, if I uh, move this quantum extremal surface in this outward direction in the past, uh, it starts approaching uh, the light cone of the of the boundary time I'm interested in. So I start being interested in the entropy of some sort of almost null interval. And uh, approaching that light cone, the entropy has some singularity. Uh, and that singularity in the entropy can be used to actually cancel against, uh, against the variation of the area. And we find that this thing is stationary. Um, I might just um, say, so you might be worried here that this would mean that the uh, quantum extremal surface is, uh, is becoming uh, within a sort of Planckian distance of the light cone, and you might worry that uh, this is actually invalidating uh, effective field theory. Um, it turns out that effective field theory is actually valid the whole time if I were to consider sort of the proper separation between the boundary uh, and quantum extremal surface, that's, that's still large. And it's really this, the fact that it looks very close to null is, uh, is some coordinate dependent statement that's just really an artifact of using these coordinates. But, um, but from the point of view of these Poincaré coordinates, it's this light cone singularity that's, uh, that's important. And this is, yeah, this is another avatar of sort of large boosts that occur near horizons of, uh, of black holes that are familiar from other contexts. Okay. Uh, the easier thing is to extremize uh, this generalized entropy in the, the out uh, in this outgoing direction, uh, and now there's there's no sort of singularities we expect in the entropy, um, but luckily we can uh, we can make the area the variation of the area be very small by itself just by putting this uh, extremal surface very close to the apparent horizon. The apparent horizon is by definition the point at which the variation of the area in the outgoing direction vanishes. So the upshot of these two statements is that we have a quantum extremal surface that's close to the apparent horizon uh, and is separated from the light cone um, by some uh, sort of Planckian light cone separation. Uh, and if you combine these two statements, you discover there's a quantum extremal surface, it's close to the horizon, uh, and the ingoing time of this quantum extremal surface uh, lags by this uh, logarithmic, um, this, uh, this time that's logarithmic in the entropy, which is the scrambling time. Or here it's logarithmic, not in the total entropy, but the entropy minus the entropy that an extreme black hole. Uh, Sorry, can, can, can you elaborate on the origin of this of this particular uh, expression? And I understand yeah. it's funny time, but like, uh, does it does it come about here from some uh, so speaking independent considerations, or or this is built in fraction? Uh, so I didn't get all the the last bits of the question. Uh, Sorry, my, my question. Well, my, my question is like, uh, is it is it something that uh, is built in the construction, or you just do a calculation and it happens to be the case that uh, when that that, that that at this at this locus uh, the relation between times is is such and such. Uh, so the fact that you get something like this, um, you you can intuit from the from this the physics of what's going on to cancel this variation. Uh, so, and it's, it, because of that, it's more generic. So it's not just going to apply to our ADS2 setup. Uh, so the reason is that um, we like this. So, okay, first of all, this outgoing variation tells us that the quantum extremal surface lives close to the horizon. Um, but uh, now, um, but we also need it to have a, uh, in the, in this ingoing null direction, we need the quantum extremal surface to have a sort of Planckian separation uh, from the past light cone of the time we're interested in on the boundary. And uh, 
that so that sort of means that we have to um, to to relate this ingoing time y minus to the time the proper time u of the of the boundary state we're interested in. You have to follow an outgoing null geodesic that starts a Planckian distance from the horizon, starts at the stretched horizon in that language, if you like, and ask when it reaches the boundary. And that is one definition of the scrambling time. Oh, yeah. So the fact that there's a logarithm here is uh, is sort of the inverse of the, the exponential boost between the sort of Rindler time near the horizon and the uh, and the boundary time. Uh, yeah, so that's why you get this um, this logarithmic this time that's logarithmic in G Newton. Um, is that? Uh, Henry, I know we started a bit late and we've been slowing you down with lots of questions, uh, but do you think maybe another 10 minutes or so would be enough time to... Uh, oh, plenty, yeah. Okay, yeah. Super. No, 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 no rush then. Okay. Um, okay, uh, so now let's... Um, uh, okay, so we've lo located the quantum extremal surface, so now we can start applying this to the questions we asked uh, at the beginning. Uh, so first of all, um, the evolution of the, the entropy. So for this quantum extremal surface at very early times, you can compute how the entropy varies, uh, and you get a, a curve that looks like this. Uh, and there's some nice physics in here. So first of all, at very early times, the entropy increasing here, and this is because the, the shock itself, this positive energy uh, input contains a lot of energy. Uh, and then for a while, uh, the entropy starts decreasing and you can interpret this as just, you have some thermal Hawking radiation and that Hawking radiation is escaping. Uh, so of course, you, uh, this decreases the fine grain entropy. But eventually, um, the, the system sort of, the black hole kind of notices that you've given it more energy. You've fed it a little bit with this positive energy shock. Uh, and it starts to access this new piece of phase space, these new states you've opened up by increasing the energy. So after this, this time, the, en the entropy starts increasing again. Uh, and this is sort of a, a, a scrambling uh, of the system. And it happens at this time. But that's a, a small piece of uh, interesting physics that I think deserves a bit more exploration. But, um, but the more interesting case, again, is, the, is what happens at, at later times. Uh, so um, we had two different sorts of, uh, of quantum extremal surface, one that was started near the bifurcation surface uh, here. And if you compute the, um, the entropy or the generalized entropy of that quantum extremal surface, it follows this green curve, uh, roughly speaking. Uh, this other surface that appears at later times uh, it's, this lives, as we said before, quite close to the horizon. Uh, so this means that uh, the, the generalized entropy of this the red quantum extremal surface is close to the thermal entropy of the black hole. Uh, so if I wanted to compute the von Neumann entropy, uh, I, I want to find the generalized entropy uh, of the quantum extremal surface that minimizes S-gen. So that means I just take the lower of these two curves, and that lands me precisely uh, on the page curve. And the way this happens is, is quite interesting, is that at the page time, which is the time when the entropy of the black hole becomes maximal again, uh, this quantum extremal surface jumps. It has a first order phase transition where it goes from some early time and jumps right up into the uh, late times up here. Okay. And the second thing we were interested in was hayden Preskill. Um, but what I've said about the quantum extremal surface uh, lagging by a scrambling time is, again, precisely what we need for the hayden Preskill prediction to, uh, to be realized. And it's now realized in this geometric way uh, by the location of the quantum extremal surface. Uh, good. Uh, so at this point, you may sort of declare victory and be bold and say that you've solved the information paradox. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, that's not the case. So if you actually examined in our model uh, the Hawking radiation that came out, it's still not consistent with unitarity. So the Hawking radiation that escapes 
uh, doesn't have the correlations that would be required by unitarity uh, and the entropy if you collected the you collect the Hawking radiation in this ordinary quantum system and you compute it as entropy again uh, you can uh, you can cook up some violation of unitarity of, of some entropy inequality for example uh, so there's still information loss going on here um, but nonetheless uh, it, it's uh, it feels like you've uh, gained something uh, and I'm sure this will uh, fuel debate is the suggestion that you can nonetheless recover these signatures of unitarity from a purely uh, semi-classical picture. Um, so I better wrap up in the next couple of minutes. Um, I'll just briefly mention what happens in this two-sided case where you have a purifying system. Um, so because the bulk um, fields are in a mixed state, it means that the uh, quantum extremal surface for the, the system on the right is different from a quantum extremal surface for the system on the left. So the right system would have uh, this blue quantum extremal surface and the left would have this pink and they have different entropies. Um, but if I had access to the whole system LR, uh, again, it's in a mixed state, but then the quantum extremal surface would, would cover the whole space time. Uh, so there's this, um, this sort of error correction story for example if you like where the where no the, this region in the middle is not accessible to the left CFT or the right CFT but it is accessible to, to both of them together okay so let me um, just wrap up um, so we uh, we looked at a uh, uh, quantum extremal surfaces and uh, in this context an evaporating black hole and we discovered that it as a phase transition at the page time and this phase transition allows the generalized entropy to follow the page curve and reproduce the von Neumann entropy expected from a unitary evaporation of black hole. And also uh, we found that the location of the quantum extremal surface gave us a geometric realization of the Hayden Preskill protocol. Uh, and we did everything in a nice model where we could solve everything exactly. Um, but the physics of it is, uh, is a bit more general and you can understand the principles that have gone into uh, into uh, into the calculations and apply them to some other black holes. Um, you could also apply this same thing to a black hole, not where we started with a, a thermal state, but a black hole actually formed from collapse. Uh, and in that case, this quantum extremal surface at early times is actually just the empty set. Uh, but other than that, everything stays more or less the same. Uh, and I'll start with just one conclusion that I found was made very clear by, um, by this analysis, uh, which is what happens if you were to form a black hole from collapse and uh, collect all the Hawking radiation and measure it all in some natural, simple basis. And then after measuring all the radiation at some very late time, jump into the black hole. Uh, and in that case, if you believe subregion duality and ADS-CFT and all the other ingredients I've used here, I think it's inevitable that you have to expect a firewall when you reach the, the horizon because you've reached the edge of the, uh, the entanglement wedge. And since you've measured all the Hawking radiation, whatever's inside is projected into some horrible state. And I'm going to call that a firewall. Uh, but I'm sure that'll give fodder for discussion in the future. And uh, thanks for your attention. I invite any questions. Thank you. I, I had a question about this jump in the surface you mentioned a few slides ago. Hmm. Um, I don't know if, uh, that that one. Yeah. So, what's going on in the well, is the jump because of the shock wave you mentioned? I mean, naively, these are geometric. This quantum extremal surface is a geometrical object, so I'm expecting yeah. um, it to happen in, in the bulk perspective for that to have this violent uh, jump like that. Can you explain that a bit more? Um, sure, yeah, so this is... Um, this continuity is jump in the surface. Yeah, so um, so what's going on, is, yeah, so this, 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 this jump, um, it's crucial that we have this um, sort of global minimization. So this, this green extremal surface sort of carries on existing for later times, and the red extremal surface, again, exists for earlier times and later times. Um, but there's just an exchange of, of dominance, if you like. Oh, it's just, it becomes the minimum, just, just exchange. Yeah. 
So it's just using them. Yeah. And it's, yeah, something maybe I should have emphasized more is, is why there's even a time evolution of the quantum extremal surfaces. And it's, it's again, because this evolution of just the, this CFT that's dual to this state is, is not by itself unitary. So it means that the state on the boundary is really changing in a, in a very important way. It's only unitary once you've included the auxiliary system. I see. Next. Any other questions? From people online? Okay. If not, then let's thank uh, Henry again.